My name's Arthur, and I thank you for joining me as we share together Numbers chapter 36 this morning. This is a short final chapter to the book of Numbers, and it is an addendum to a matter that was raised earlier. One of the men of Israel only had daughters, and his daughters had made a submission to Moses that they should receive the inheritance of their father, rather than their father's name be blotted out. And Moses had consulted the Lord, and the Lord had affirmed that that was the appropriate thing to do. But there was a potential issue with that, and that issue is discussed in this final addendum to Numbers, chapter 36. Now the chief fathers of the families of the children of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, of the families of the sons of Joseph, came near and spoke before Moses and before the leaders, the chief fathers of the children of Israel. And they said, The Lord commanded my Lord Moses to give the land as an inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of our brother Zelophehad to his daughters. Now, if they are married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the children of Israel, then their inheritance will be taken from the inheritance of our fathers, and it will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. So it will be taken from the lot of our inheritance. And when the jubilee of the children of Israel comes, then their inheritance will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. So their inheritance will be taken away from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. Then Moses commanded the children of Israel according to the word of the Lord, saying, What the tribe of the sons of Joseph says is right. This is what the Lord commands concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, Let them marry whom they think best, but they may marry only within the family of their father's tribe. So the inheritance of the children of Israel shall not change hands from tribe to tribe, for Every one of the children of Israel shall keep the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter who possesses an inheritance in any tribe of the children of Israel shall be the wife of one of the family of her father's tribe, so that the children of Israel each may possess the inheritance of his fathers. Thus no inheritance shall change hands from one tribe to another, but every tribe of the children of Israel shall keep its own inheritance. Just as the Lord commanded Moses, so did the daughters of Zelophehad. For Mala, Terzah, Hogla, Milcah, and Noah, the daughters of Zelophehad, were married to the sons of their father's brothers. They were married into the families of the children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and their inheritance remained in the tribe of their father's family. These are the commandments and the judgments which the Lord commanded the children of Israel by the hand of Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. May the Lord bless these words to us. So this is an addendum, a clarification of the law that says the inheritance can pass to the daughters. The daughters may only marry within their tribe, whoever they wish, The choice of a husband is still open for them, but it is slightly restricted in that they cannot marry across tribal boundaries. And this is a principle that is established and repeated through the biblical record. The story of Ruth focuses very much on this. When Naomi's husband and her two sons died, and Ruth came back to the land, and Naomi came back, there was no man to take the inheritance. And so Ruth could marry, but the rule was that she only marry a near kinsman. And so Boaz was the near kinsman who was prepared to take the responsibility of the land to retain it within the tribe. That title ultimately passed to David, the son of Jesse, and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Having now concluded reading Numbers, what overall lessons might we gain from this book? The first comment I would make is, a nation is made up of individuals, and individual choices 
affect the destiny of the nation. So we had this large number of people coming out of Egypt. But individuals complained and judgment came upon individuals and judgment came upon the whole people. When it was time to go into the promised land, the twelve spies reported the land was good, but ten of them were fearful of the giants who were there, and they thought, the cities are fortified, we cannot defeat them. Only two saw that this was something that God could do and that they should go ahead. Having given a bad report, this influenced the whole nation. And we had the situation of Moses with two men against the whole nation. And God intervened to save those three men and put judgment on the whole nation. So when we have negative thoughts and we express them, then those negative ideas can quickly spread and make a whole society negative. The rebellion of one leads to the rebellion of many. And so the the account of the children of Israel in the wilderness is one of much rebellion and much judgment on the part of God. For God had to judge the wicked that he might preserve for himself a people. If he had not judged, then the whole nation would have been destroyed. The answer in the gospel to this problem of negative thinking is that we have hope in God. We do not see the future except through faith. For the circumstances of this world are very bleak indeed. For all the efforts and promises that politicians have made for peace in our time, yet there has not been peace at any time since the Lord Jesus was on the earth. There have always been wars and rumours of wars, conflicts in many parts of the world because of the rebellious attitude of men. And God has allowed judgment to fall on people because of these rebellious attitudes. But he promises that there is a future. There will be a remnant. The children will, in the end, be saved. So the children of Israel, the soldiers who came out of Egypt, died in the wilderness. But their children would come into the land. So it is, before the throne, we're told that there will be from every tribe and people and tongue and nation. No ethnic group, no language group, no tribal group, no nation will fail to have a representative before the throne on the day we gather to worship our Lord Jesus. But there will be many who will not be there because they have not believed the gospel and obeyed it. As Paul says in Hebrews, there remains a day of rest for the people of God. While the children of Israel were in the plains of Moab, the tribe of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh saw the lands were suitable for grazing and asked to take up their inheritance there. And the Lord accepted that on the condition that their soldiers supported those who went over to occupy the land west of the Jordan. And the challenge was, if you do not do this, be sure your sin will find you out. So those of us who are in circumstances of peace have a responsibility to support those in trouble. The Christian experience is not just that we might have a nice time ourselves but we must stand solidly with the whole company of the Lord's people. And in many places of the world, they are suffering greatly. It is necessary for us then to be aware of their suffering and to stand by them. Also, God had instituted a procedure, daily, weekly, monthly and annual rituals that they might keep God before their eyes all the time. But the principle remains, we must seek God on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a continuing basis, to walk in his ways, to confess our sin, that we might be his servants, and fulfill the good works that he prepared beforehand 
that we should walk in them.